Today we're going to be talking about Stamford Hill, a town in London like no other, with the biggest Hasidic Jewish population in the whole of Europe, who have created their own closed off society right in the middle of London, so closed off that they even have their own type of police force, ambulances and education system. Today we'll be delving deep into the community and showing life inside Stamford Hill. Let's get into it. <laughs> Now Stamford Hill is the epicentre for Jewish culture in the UK, but let's quickly run through how this developed. Now Judaism as a whole has had quite a harsh run in the UK. The first Jewish settlements came in the year 1066, after William the Conqueror invaded Britain and brought in rich Jewish businessmen to help out his government. Long story short, these Jewish merchants and English people didn't get along too well, and after years of anti-Semitism and abuse towards them, Jewish people were expelled from England in the year 1290, pretty much leaving UK's Jewish population extinct, but anti-semitism wasn't only a UK problem, this was an issue all over Europe for many centuries. Anti-Jewish riots and killings was occurring in countries like Russia and Spain, leading to many Jews migrating back to the UK, where stuff wasn't as bad anymore. This defection skyrocketed in the 1930s, when the Nazis took power of Germany and started their mass genocide of Jews all over Europe. By the time the Nazis were defeated in World War II, it was estimated that 2 out of every 3 Jews in Europe had been killed, and the majority that did survive ran as far as they could, taking refuge in the new state of Israel or in America. But a lot of Jews also did stay in Britain, building small communities in places like Manchester and Hertfordshire. But one of the most popular spots was a town in North London called Stamford Hill. Stamford Hill had already had a quite healthy Jewish community even before World War II. In 1926, the URHC was established in the town, which is basically an organisation set up to protect traditional Jewish communities. And even way before that in the 17 to 1800s, many European Jews had already settled in the small town and built up a healthy community, which only got larger in the 1950s, when other Jewish people from outside of Europe, like India and Morocco, started flocking to Stamford Hill. Since the 50s, the Jewish population in the UK has dropped more than half in size, mainly due to intermarriages and the youth not being as interested in keeping up faith and tradition. But there is one group keeping the religion alive and thriving in the UK. The Hasidic Jewish community. Hasidism is a Jewish movement which started around 250 years ago in Eastern Europe. They pretty much reject just about anything non-essential that distracts them from getting closer to God, including the internet and most modern technology. The way Hasidic Jews live is so different to the majority of the world that they almost always separate themselves from everyone else, normally only interacting with each other. There are a few small Hasidic Jewish communities throughout the UK, but none compared to the size of Stamford Hill, which literally has has the highest concentrated amount of Hasidic Jews in the whole of Europe. Giving Stamford Hill the nickname the Square Mile of Piety, with piety meaning devotion to God, you can see the Jewish influence all over the town. Corner stores and butchers sell strictly kosher meat, and the small area is full of people wearing very distinctive Orthodox Jewish clothing, to the point you'll stand out if you're not wearing the same. While these are very rare characteristics for most UK towns, it gets even more unique, with their very own private police force and ambulance service. In 2008, a local reverend called Ephraim Goldstein, set up a Jewish neighbourhood watch in Stamford Hill after many concerns about the area. 2008 was a hard time for many in London. The global financial crisis from the previous year crashed down on a lot of the population, causing many to lose their jobs, houses and financial stability, which resulted in quite a bit of social unrest in the city. Hasidic residents were becoming more and more worried about anti-Semitic attacks around these times, and were particularly concerned about an increase of robberies, of their expensive all Orthodox Jewish hats that cost anywhere between one to five thousand pounds. So a type of Jewish police force was set up to monitor Stamford Hill and parts of Northwest London, who also have some Hasidic residents. They named it the Shomrim, which in Hebrew means protection, and was based on a similar organisation that was set up a few decades before in New York. The Shomrim was an immediate success in Stamford Hill. In its first five months of operation, the emergency hotline received two thousand calls, reporting on a range of incidents in the area 
area and on average now receives around 4,500 calls a year. Some rim officers are unpaid volunteers from the Hasidic community. Once they sign up they go through informal training at Stoke Newton Police Station and are kept up to date about new targeted police operations in the area. Their system doesn't work too much different from the traditional police. They have a 24 hour service where you could call one of their operators to report a crime who will then send out a volunteer to deal with the situation. Despite the strong rim officers not having any authority to arrest suspects, they can detain them until police arrive which has been a big help to local authorities. The whole setup was a big success for the Hasidic community where many don't speak much English so can't communicate with normal police officers. Some also feel much more comfortable reporting on issues they're having with other Hasidics to the Shomrim rather than outsiders. There has been some controversy surrounding that though. In Jewish culture there's something called Mazira which is quite strictly forbidden. Mazira is the act of a Jewish person reporting another Jewish person to a non-Jewish person which means it's quite looked down on for a Shomrim officer to notify the police about a matter that involves two Jewish people. This caused quite a big stir in 2013 when it was found out through a Channel 4 documentary that multiple instances of child abuse had been covered up by the Stanford Hill community leaders which questioned the integrity of the Shomrim when it comes to reporting crimes within their own community. Either way with Stanford Hill generally having the lowest crime rate in the whole of Hackney, the Shomrim have been praised for their work. They also don't discriminate when it comes to who they help either, with around 64% of calls coming in from non-Jewish people. The Shomrim has built a reputation as being a trustworthy service that some even trust more than the Metropolitan Police, which has earned them thousands of pounds of government funding to keep them going. The force has also been a great way for integration between Hasidic Jews and other outsiders to their community. In 2013 after the tragic murder of ex-soldier Lee Rigby by the hands of two radical Muslim extremists, the Shomrim offered protection to local Muslim residents and mosques due to the spike in anti-Islamic hate crime around London, something that was praised by worldwide officials. Alongside the Shomrim, the community also has its own ambulance service. When travelling through Stamford Hill you may notice ambulance vehicles with a big sign on the side reading Hatzola, which a lot of people actually don't know is a private emergency service set up by the Hasidic people. Hatzola derives from the Hebrew word rescue and that's exactly what they do. It was set up in London in 1979 after their initial success in Israel and New York and has been very important to the Hasidic community once again due to Yiddish only speakers but also due to their ability to provide care while not breaking Jewish rules and traditions while doing so. This is especially important for women who can't be physically exposed to men and normally not meant to have any communication with men unless it's their husband or immediate family. Also due to volunteers being a part of the wider community it also allows smoother updates and alerts on patients conditions to family members and their rabbis. The Hatzola has been such a massive benefit to the area that it even received an award directly from the king in 2023. But the Hatzola has also came with a fair share of controversy. While some volunteers do use the traditional NHS licensed ambulance vehicles, it was reported many were also using their personal private vehicles strapped with illegal blue sirens when responding to incidents. This caused a big legal issue after two volunteers attended the site of a crash with their personal cars in 2014 which resulted in them being charged for breaching traffic laws. Throughout the years the Hasidic community as a whole has had its fair share of legal issues. One problem that keeps coming up is their educational system. Just like other religions there are many Jewish schools all over London which offer a unique mix of normal mainstream education alongside deeper religious studies and services. These schools are fully state funded and allow non-Jewish people to attend but the vast majority of families within the Hasidic community don't normally tend to send their kids to these type of schools. Instead Hasidic girls are sent to independent schools where they learn the national curriculum just like everyone else with the only difference being censorship on anti-Jewish topics like evolution and parts of science. But boys are brought up from a very early age to strictly only learn about religion. Hasidic boys are expected to know the Torah and Talmud back to front and are trained to not take much if any interest in anything else apart from this. In Judaism you become an adult at 13. When you reach this age you have something called a bar mitzvah and then you're expected to take your religious matters much more seriously. After the bar mitzvah the now young man will be pulled out of whatever education he was in before and will start attending what is called the yeshiva which 
which is a school laser focused on learning Jewish texts. In this yeshiva's English is rarely spoken and the national curriculum of learning is not followed. Your only focus is learning and observing Jewish texts and you're kind of scared away from an early age not to interact with outsiders. School hours can last anywhere from 6am to 11pm and it's normal for a boy that are attending these yeshivas to leave their family homes and move into accommodation sometimes with around eight kids in one room so they can't be distracted from their learning while the hackney council has been aware of these illegal schools for years the situation came under national attention in 2016 after a yeshiva in stanford hill took 34 young boys on a trip to hike the white cliffs of dover while hiking a young boy tripped over and was stuck while a tide was coming in causing him to be dangerously close to being swept into the sea this was despite many signs showing they shouldn't go past the area they went into but since the boys had little to no understanding of english they couldn't read the signs the two adults that were on the scene called their community leaders for help before emergency services but eventually after running out of options they called 999 who managed to send out an emergency team to save them this dangerous trip increased the public pressure to shut these schools down and posed the question of how this is even happening technically these schools are illegal Every UK citizen has to attend a DfE registered school between the ages of 5 to 16. You can choose to put your kid through homeschooling, but your child legally has to follow the national curriculum. The truth is, there's no real clear answer to how the yeshivas have been getting away with it. There have been countless battles throughout the years between Hackney's council and educational officials about the issue, but because the yeshivas don't follow the national curriculum, they can't be legally classified as a school so can't be closed down. In 2022, the government actually proposed a way to prevent this by passing through new laws which would force local authorities to keep a record of children who are not in mainstream education and to also allow national school inspectors more power to monitor any that aren't. This bill was actually protested by the Hasidic community outside of parliament and was eventually scrapped out of nowhere. A next member of the community called Izzy Polson publicly gave his insight on how these schools are operated. He talks about how the schools are left in really bad conditions and teachers weren't afraid to hit students if they got out of line. By the time the boys are ready to leave the yeshivas, they won't know much about the outside world, apart from historical events which involve the persecution of Jews, like the Holocaust, which gives context to the young community to why they're so closed off to the outside. Most boys will leave these yeshivas around the age of 18 to 22, when they're expected to get married. Marriage is normally organised through someone they call a shazan, which is a matchmaker to pair the boy up with a potential why. During this process, each boy will have a kind of CV, which will include interests, plans for the future and educational accomplishments. And girls will normally be ranked on how rich and powerful her family are. After the Shazam finds a match, the pair could go on several dates where they decide if they want to get married to each other. If they both agree, they could both be married as soon as a week after. Now when a man gets married, he now has the choice of what he wants to do in life. He can enter something called a Kalel, which is essentially a deeper full-time education of the religion but many will opt to start working and earning a living now obviously the hasidic community is quite closed off to the rest of the country so a regular nine to five isn't really on the card but because they are so closed off means that they like to keep most of their purchases and services within themselves which has pretty much created their own small economy and job market every hasidic house will have a jewish phone book which literally has pages on pages of different everyday services which can be provided by somebody directly from the community this could be anything from a Hasidic plumber, accountant, real estate agent, taxi service, or even just someone to help them out financially. Stanford Hill also has numerous amount of Hasidic owned shops as well, meaning there's not really that much need to be interacting with any non-Jewish people day to day, and allows money to stay within their community. Some of these practices have caused some outroar though, specifically Jewish house and associations. Now Hasidic Jewish people have many different needs to other UK residents. Contraception is prohibited, leading to quite large families, which has actually made Stanford Hill to have the highest child population in the whole of Europe, resulting in many Hasidic people needing to live in larger houses. Originally this was a big issue within the community, due to families sometimes 10 plus cramming into two or three bedroom houses, but eventually multiple Jewish housing associations would be created, who works with Jewish property developers to build new bigger houses, and work on extensions on existing houses to facilitate the growing community. This has caused some controversy along the years though. Many Jewish housing associations will only accept 
Jewish residents to their properties, which has made it near impossible for other people to buy properties in certain parts of Stamford Hill and other predominantly Jewish areas. Quite recently, this practice came under fire after a non-Jewish mother of four was seeking an apartment in a new housing development in Stamford Hill. But due to the development being under a Jewish housing association, she was denied plainly just due to her not being Jewish. Soon this might not be possible though. With a massively growing population and rising rent prices in London, many Hasidic families have ventured out to more rural parts of the country, setting up smaller communities in places like Canvey Island and Essex. Unfortunately though, many of the families that do end up moving away have reported many instances of anti-Semitic abuse. This is a big issue within Stamford Hill as well though. Anti-Semitic attacks have left families in the town in constant fear. While this has been going on for decades, attacks have been ever so more common after the tragic events going on in Israel and Palestine, which unfortunately has left many attacks on Jewish civilians in Stamford Hill. Despite the vast majority of Hasidics not even supporting Israel's actions, most don't even recognize Israel as a state, and the community have even campaigned publicly against this, and held free Palestine protests in London. Despite this, hate crimes towards the community in 2024 have been the worst they have for a very long time. There was even a case of a 30 year old man called Abdullah Qureshi, travelling 180 miles from his house to go to Stamford Hill for the sole purpose of attacking random Jews on the streets, which if anything is making the community not want to integrate even more. Despite being so segregated, we do sometimes see glimpses of Hasidic culture as outsiders though. On Saturday, Stamford Hill completely transforms due to Shabbat taking place, which is where Jewish people do not work, cook or use any type of electricity, leaving Stamford Hill quite quiet while taking place, which is the complete opposite to Purim, a sacred Jewish holiday held once a year. During Purim, the community gathers up on the streets of Stamford Hill in either fancy dress or traditional clothing and throw a big street party. On this day, you can see the community drink, eat and dance away to music all day, which gives the everyday person a rare insight into Hasidic culture. This seclusion of the community does also have many downsides, mainly when it comes to people who want to leave it. A lot of Hasidics don't know much about life outside of their community, making it very tough for people to venture out. Recently, there's been a lot of cases of people wanting to leave the structure and explore the outside world, but due to poor English skills and no knowledge of anything outside of their bubble, the choice doesn't look too promising. A famous example of this is the man I mentioned earlier, Izzy Pozen, who left the Stanford Hill community at 20 years old, with no educational qualifications, no real English skills and no one to support him on the outside. He was left homeless and had to teach himself English by reading books, eventually getting a degree and finding a job with some outside help. Cases of younger Hasidic boys and girls wanting to leave has started to become more common in recent years. So a charity was set up called Mavar, who helps and guides people who are attempting to leave, pairing them up with a social network and mentoring, and also just an overall guide on how to survive on the outside. Despite all of this, in 2024 the community is growing at a faster pace than ever. Many people do have criticisms of the group, but one thing can't be faulted is how strong they are, surviving multiple genocides throughout the years, while still growing in size and staying true to their roots. Hopefully this continues well into the future. It's been your boy Kid Nerd and peace out.